The story takes place on the 12th of February 1912 in Trim Industrial School. 27-year-old teacher John Kelly was on yard duty after supper at around half six in the evening. He was originally from Rush in North Dublin and, and he joined the school in 1905 as one of the assistant headmasters. So basically at the school there was the headmaster, Samuel Kelly, who had been there 22 years, and then three assistant headmasters who were obviously then teachers. In this school there could be up to like 120 boys um, and they were usually like in their teens up to 16 and they were there to obviously learn and to gain a trade you know like learn a trade and then typically around 16 they would leave and so each of the three assistant headmasters kind of had like a, a certain section of the boys to look after so like that john kelly was in his yard looking after like his boys and so on the 12th around 7 p.m then samuel kelly the headmaster was like going, you know, on a wander, kind of doing a round of the school to check everything. And he would say that when he got to John Kelly's yard, there was, quote, an unusual stillness in the yard. And basically all the boys had like kind of gathered under the shed. And so he headed towards them and was saying, you know, like, what's going on? And none of them answered. And again, he said, what's going on? And then he saw behind. John Kelly was lying on the ground unconscious, blood gushing from his head. The headmaster ran up to the school and got his housekeeper to come down and basically stay with um, John Kelly. And he then sent a porter to go get the doctor and police and the priest. Can't forget them. At this stage, the boys kind of like scattered. Uh, when they were called back for a roll call later, two of the boys would be missing. 15-year-old Thomas Riley and 16-year-old Patrick O'Hara. They wouldn't be found until the following morning in Clonee, which was near kind of in between Mead and Dublin, uh, by the police. The headmaster and another teacher, Mr. Murtaugh, would carry John Kelly to like the infirmary. It was about 50 metres away. The doctor arrived, but John Kelly would die shortly after this. He had been severely beaten with different instruments that we'll get into. And it was found like his skull and his jaw were completely smashed. Now, at the inquiry, the coroner would ask Samuel Kelly, the headmaster, questions. And basically asked like that, you know, was he a nice teacher? Was he kind? Stuff like this. And he said yes. He, in fact, he said that he never came to him with any issues about any of the boys. You know, to say that the boys had misbehaved or anything like this. And at first it makes it sound like that's, that's a good thing. But then also, I mean, teenagers mess. So to come... So, like, to say that you've never had to complain about them, I then feel like, is that a case of, you know, was it a case then that he kind of dealt with these things himself? And is that where we are where we are? Samuel Kelly would actually suggest that it was over tea that had been stolen from the Porter's Lodge. He had apparently found a boy in the Porter's Lodge and searched him and found a key that he had previously lost. However, another reason that would come up um, from actually younger witnesses was because... John Kelly wouldn't allow the, the boys to kick balls in the yard. I don't know. I mean, if it is, then he's pretty strict because I think that's a basic thing that kids do in the yard. One of the probably youngest witnesses was seven-year-old Joseph Hart. He would say that by lunchtime, it was already common knowledge that what went down was going to go down. In fact, he would say that he heard Riley and O'Hara and another boy, Peter Tewitt, ask Patrick Cox if, if he was ready to hit Kelly and he said he was. Little Joseph would say that he was in the shed when John Kelly came into the yard and that eight of these boys were lined up with their weapons. So this was basically like the big scrubbing brushes. There was hurley sticks and then just sticks. John Kelly then walked up the yard and as he turned with his back to the boys, Riley hit him in the head with the scrubbing brush. He would fall to the ground and then all the boys would just rush in. Peter Tewitt, William Smith and Philip Farley beat him with hurley sticks. The Cox had a stick but little Joseph would say that he did not see him hit him. He saw Patrick O'Hara hit him with a sweeping rush in the chest. Joseph's older brother Edward Hart would also corroborate his little brother's testimony and he would say that that morning he heard them saying are you ready for the lion's den tonight? He said he saw uh, O'Hara, Tewitt and Cox and another boy, James Brennan, run towards him, but that he didn't see any of them hit him. He reckoned John Kelly was hit about 10 times. Now, this is where it gets interesting. He would say that he believes 
John Kelly walked down, you know, past all the boys to show that he wasn't afraid. Apparently he was aware that there was, you know, an ill feeling towards him and these boys and that a plan had been talked about. In fact, that morning, the teacher had told his students, if you think you have a coward in me, you are mistaken. I will be down in the yard tonight and I will see who will touch me. Another witness, Terence Martin, another student, he said that he saw O'Reilly hit him with the brush and that after he fell, he saw O'Hara, Tuit and Smith hit him but didn't see Cox or Brennan hitting him. Cox, however, had threatened to beat him and told him to go off and get a tar brush for him. The postmortem would show that the cause of death was shock and hemorrhage and that he would have died within 30 minutes of this beating. So the jury for the inquest took just 30 minutes of deliberation to come back with a verdict that John Kelly had died as a result of these injuries. And so of these boys, five were charged with murder and three were charged with manslaughter. The trial went ahead a few weeks later and basically the judge told the jury that they could find the boys guilty of murder or manslaughter. Peter Tewitt and William Smith were found guilty of manslaughter and they were sentenced to three years imprisonment each. Patrick Cox and Patrick O'Hara were also found guilty of manslaughter and they were sentenced to 12 months with hard labour. The charges against James Brennan were actually just thrown out. They said there wasn't enough evidence. And then Philip Farley and another boy, John Conlon, were found not guilty, which kind of makes sense because this is the first time I'm even saying John Conlon to you. But again, obviously, wasn't enough evidence there. Now... I'm not sure about the other six boys. I know Patrick O'Hara was 16, but I'm not sure how old the other ones are. However, Thomas O'Reilly was 15 when this happened. So he was found guilty of manslaughter and sentenced to three years in a reformatory. However, when no reformatory would take him, this was changed to two years hard labour. Now, I mean, like me, you might be wondering kind of why was there more to it, especially in industrial schools and stuff like that, if you know the history there. Um... And the defence actually bring this up and they basically say, like, was there any reason for any of the boys to, like, fear him? You know, he even asked, like, you know, did he come into the rooms at night? And, quote, they did not want him to come among them, end quote. So I don't know if he, if that's saying, like, yeah, well, he did or just that they had a fear that that's what he would do. Uh, they asked, you know, was he popular among the students? And they said no. Now, the judge kind of quickly told him to move along from this kind of line of questioning suggesting things like this really i don't know could it really just have been about some stolen tea could it really just have been about a ball not being allowed to be kicked in the yard i think it's weird i feel like there, there had to have been more to it but then you would think like why didn't if that was what was going on why didn't they just come out and say that they might have gone off or something i don't know anyway you guys can let me know what you think of this one John Kelly was his mother's only son. She was actually a widow. And so he was buried here then in Whitestown Graveyard in Dublin. That's it for today.